All right, so welcome to the Silver Tongue Devil Anthology Book Launch. I'm so excited to be here today and that so many people join us. I really feel that this event is you know, more than it could have been if we had a live event. We have people coming here today from Switzerland, Kathmandu, Australia, and Bucharest, Romania, among different states in, in America. So it's an international book launch and that's really thrilling for me. Uh, this is my first real book. I used to make a little hand, a lot of free books and hand them out, but this is a real book that you can buy in a store. So I'm so thrilled to be a part of that. And, um, you know, it was really a labor of love. And I want to thank Murphy for taking on this, this really, this task with me. Um, I thought we were really in, you know, a, in agreement together that we both wanted to do this project, but Murphy tells me I kind of roped him into it. Um, so I, I asked him for help putting this anthology together. And together we read over 300 submissions from everybody and we chose, you know, what we felt was it felt was the essence of the rhyme show and the downtown New York writing scene. And uh, we put it together to make this book. Um, you know, over that time, we both had unexpected deaths in our family and sometimes we felt like we got over it in over our heads. But anytime I reached out to Murphy, he was always there to keep with push forward and push forward. And then when we finally got to the end of the book, um, we had the, all the guts all together, but we didn't really know about production and how to do a cover. And Philip stepped in and Philip designed the cover for us. Um, he had a vision. He knew exactly what it wanted to look like. And I, I don't think we could have got a better cover. And he helped us with the final production. And, and now we have a book. And um, I want to thank Philip for creating this show. Um, not only was it a warm and welcoming you know, series, but um, you know, he recorded everybody and put them on YouTube. So before this book even existed, there, there, is, there is a record of his show and everybody reading at his show, whether you're a silver tongue devil or not, um, he recorded everybody. Um, so after this, we're gonna have another video recording because we'll have this book launch on YouTube. And now we have this book that will forever be a memory. So I really think it's just a great kind of package and memory of it's just a really wonderful five years that we had down in uh, the Lower East Side at this reading series. Um, so, and, you know, I just want to thank everybody for trusting us with your work and um, being patient. And, um, you know, I, I, I know I wanted everybody to have their books by now and the delivery isn't coming until Monday for the second set of, we sold a hundred books at the book distri distribution and the second hundred is coming on Monday and um, I'll ship those out and then I'll send, you know, we'll, I'll ship more books if you're far away. We didn't offer that right away because, um, we were trying to get books out, you know, live. It was just easy to come in person. But um, we're so excited. So I'm going to pass it along to Philip and um, let's get this reading started. And really thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here today. And now I give you Philip. Hello, Silver Tongue Devils. I feel like we're at a big family reunion here. Everyone looks so beautiful and familiar. Uh, I was also told to explain what a silver tongue devil is for the benefit of some audience members who are here who is, as guests. A silver tongue devil was a writer who was featured at our Rhymes of the Ancient Mariner show and awarded a silver tongue devil t-shirt to show the world that we thought your work was excellent and that you were respected. Over the five year run of the Rhyme show, a large percentage of the audience were always silver tongue devils who came back every month to read at open mic and support the venue. That's pretty damn amazing because I was told repeatedly that once you feature an open micer, you never see them again. This fifth anniversary anthology highlights sampled works of more than 120 talented writers, performers who featured at our show. You comprise a cross-section of the most talented writers, poets, spoken word artists, storytellers, actors, and songwriters in the downtown New York City writing scene. From theater, TV, concerts, academia, cabarets, clubs, bars, and anywhere the creative writing flourishes. Following the last rhyme show, Linda Kleinbub asked me if I was planning to do an anthology of all the featured silver tongue devils. I looked at her as though she was crazy. I said, you have any idea how much work would be involved in compiling and publishing five years of Rhymes features? She was adamant. She insisted that the work produced at the show should not be forgotten and that an anthology would be a five-year time capsule of the best of downtown writing and writers. She asked if it'd be okay if she put the anthology together. I said, sure. She enlisted our associate producer, Anthony Murphy, and off they went soliciting writing from more than 300 former Silver Tongue Devils. 
I'm so profoundly proud of this published anthology, anthology, but I think both Murph and I would agree that the driving force and the hardest work done in the book was by Linda. Without her diligence and attention to detail, the book, the distribution, and this celebratory reading would never have happened. Though her contributions are immeasurable, in the end, hey, this book is your book. You wrote the book. It stands as a testament to your creativity. I like a special recognition award. It's long overdue to my tireless rhymes crew who made the monthly magic show look like simple and me look like I knew what I was doing when I really didn't. To them and their hard work, I owe any and all of any successes we share. Anthony C. Murphy, associate producer, writer, poet. Janet Restino, house manager, spoken word performer, brilliant artist. Cal Reynolds, bartender, musician, iron sculptor, and again, Linda Kleinbub for taking on a Herculean task and producing a permanent record of rhymes of the ancient mariners, brilliant silver tongued devils. Okay, now the business of the reading. We have a very long list of readers today, and I'm asking that everyone adhere to the old rhymes rule. Hope you remember it. No intros for your piece. This is about celebrating your writing. And believe me, it's good enough already to stand on its own without a two minute explanation of what it's about or a thank you to us for publishing it. It's done. Please just read your piece from the book and finish with a polite thank you so we'll know that you're done. Your bios and reading dates are at the back of the book. And we'd like you to use the Zoom chat feature for any, anything else you want to inform other readers about. You can plug your books, announce events, your planning, compliment other readers, send group thanks, or send private text to other participants or hosts. Leave your time on screen strictly for reading your poem and nothing else. We have 76 readers. That's a lot. We don't want to be here till midnight. All right, first up, some comments by the book editors. Murph, you're up first. Okay. Can't hear you, you're muted, Murph. Okay, the first of many. <laughs> When I first came to New York in 2009, I thought it would be a whole different world, like a movie. It isn't. We are similar. I first met Philip Jambry at an open mic downstairs in the old place on McDougal Street, 116 in Greenwich Village, a place where Jimmy and Bob Dylan had been. I was searching back then. And then there was the New Yorican and the Bowery round the corner. And there were good guys and gals who hosted and boosted us. There were other places with strange names like Jujo Mukti Tea Lounge and uh, the Tiki Lounge and, and always this sticky downstairs of some cellar. I found something else that stuck with Philip Giambri in a place called Bar 82. I think we just knew it wasn't all about us, even though we still wanted to talk loudly and often. I had been reading for a few years before in England but I was not that confident and stand-up comedy was king anyway. What is a line without a punch, they used to say. Well, we went to be heard and I think that's why we all went. We want to be heard and it was open. So that meant all of us had a voice and we had to listen too. Thank you. Back to Phil. <laughs> okay, guys. With that, we're going to get on with the show. Um, the show is divided up that we're going to share hosting. And Philip is going to host the first part, and then Murphy's going to host, and then I'm going to host. So um, we're going to get started with the web. It has to leave early, so um, we're going to move him up put somewhere so we can read in the first hour so we can get his reading in. And I hope nobody else starts doing that to us either because that makes the reading more complicated. Okay, Philip, it's all you. Okay, how did I get muted? Thank you, Linda. Before we begin the anthology, I think his reading, internet froze up. I'd like to acknowledge the passing of four of our silver tongue devils since the last rhyme show. Their pieces will be heard today. Matthew Abello's wife Vivian will read his poem. Maria Lazella will read Gil Fajani's poem. John S. Hall will read Steve Dalashinsky's poem, and we'll show a video of Pat Cristiano reading his poem from the book. Their passing leaves four empty seats here. 
that are very hard to fill. I hope their memory will remain alive in their published work and in this anthology. They are missed. I feel blessed to have had the opportunity to meet, promote, and befriend all of you who read at our, at our rhyme show and displayed such an amazing diversity of wit, talent, artistry. You remain in my heart and my memories forever. And we'll always be siblings in the rhymes family. Thank you, brothers and sisters. I love you all, honestly. Now, we gotta get back to the story of the rhymes first show. Rhymes of the Ancient Mariner, March. The very first poem that was read at the first show was read by me, but was written by my poet friend, Peter Schrager, who lives in Bucharest. He's joined us today and he'll be reading it for us. Peter, unmute yourself. Let's hear it. Unmute. Okay. Yes. Yes. You hear me, yeah? Yes. The ancient, yes. yes, the ancient mariner. I will join you over seas and oceans to find the real mariner, the ancient mariner, the valiant mariner, the mariner that loves fishing for words and turns them into a boat and sails with his thoughts from coast to coast, no stop, no stop. He cannot stop, cause he's the breath of the wave, cause he's the storm of the sea, cause he's the shark haunting the weak. The ancient mariner is always on the move, meandering over the salty waters, his wishes and hope and he will drink the waves and sink his sails into the coral reef to find a color for his soul. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Well, I've forgotten how beautiful that was. It, even it's dedicated it was to Philip Jambri. <laughs> <laughs> even though it was about me, I'm impressed. <laughs> Okay, the four original silver tongue doubles at the first rhyme show were Verles Duran, who's now a uh, minister to the poor, Dwayne Ferguson, and Maripona, Mariposa Fernandez and Pauline Findlay. I'm so happy the two of them are, there, are here with us today. Silver tongue double Pauline Findlay is up next, followed by silver tongue double Dwayne Ferguson, the very first two of four. Unmute your mic, Pauline, if you're here. Yeah, I'm right here. Let's go, girl. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So nice to see you guys. Okay. Thank you, Philip. Mama sits behind the weeping willow tree, weeping. She think I can't see her weeping that seeps to the root of the tree. I don't grasp the sobbing and hurt, red bloated eyes that feels damp on the rim of her sleeved coat, dead end dreams that lay in her head, and a father that didn't wed her since she's found another's bed. Money's short, bills go unpaid, never ask for handout, but works for pimp ass Johnny down the lane. Mama scrubs toilets at night, in the day, lifts her skirt at night, prays to God on Sunday, acting like life's gonna be all right. But Mama sits behind the weeping willow tree, weeping, she think I can't see her weeping that seeps to the root of the tree. I would love to put my hands on her shoulder and say, mama, this rough time will soon be over. But just in case I have this green clover, God will shower us with his blessings and will pour down when he opens the heavens. I'm sure she won't hear the reassurance of my voice cause it'll get lost in the stillness of the saddened thought. Mama tries her best, but life's got her beat. And she can't see the hope beyond that damn willow tree. Life's full of wonder, if we can just hold on a little while longer. But what can you say to a mama who sits by a weeping willow tree, weeping, if she doesn't have anything left that she believes in? Thank you, Pauline. Pauline and I met many, many years ago back at the Barnes, Barnes and Noble reading on 8th Street, 8th Street and 6th Avenue when she was so nervous 
She used to bring her church ladies with her and hand out cookies to everyone. She tried to bribe us. She didn't know she had enough talent to get by on her own. Well, we know better now. Thank you, Pauline. Oh, we love you. I love you. <laughs> Coming up next. On the open mic circuit, this guy a long, long time ago, before he had two Emmys, was called Dwayne Baby. Now he's Dwayne Ferguson. Come on up, buddy. Dwayne, did you unmute? Yep, yep. I just got it. Thank you. <clears throat> Here I stand, waiting for the tide to change, waiting for the sun to set, waiting for the day to end waiting for the change that Sam said was a coming that has me humming, I know change gonna come, oh yes it is. But what happens when change ain't nothing but jangle in your pocket and you still a dollar short of progress? When marginalized bodies are still claimed and taxed and cashed on, lining the banks of the elite like beached goliaths waiting to be stripped of their worth. Change ain't nothing but a headline, a political ideology abandoned by the so-called oppressed, clinging to a warped patriotism that turned weapons into righteous symbols, flags into gods, and protests into calls of anarchy. I know it took a while to get here. There have been many, many, many sunsets. Sunsets filled with hope, progress, and change. Sunsets spilled with blood, calloused feet, broken batons, and burnt bodies. But with every sunset, with every sunset, the sun must rise again. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Murph. Love you, Phil. <laughs> Thank you, Dwayne, baby. Okay, coming up next, Kofi Forson. Unmute, Kofi. You're muted, we can't hear you. Okay, you're good now. That was kind of weird. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Murph. This is called Sitting with Keith at a Bar on A. Some guys walk easy, they don't strut. They are one with the ground. They are a walking flag, pole tattooed and torn, blowing in the wind. Eye of a pirate, pissed on street corner, weighted on broken bombshells. Sometimes straddling a rhythm guitar, dirty jeans, wicked, alligator smile. Leather skin, British boy, good looks, Marlboro tip, tobacco tongue. Come dirty like a knife, shaking the reggae off the street. Rasta boys, no bodyguards, no lifeguards, looking deaf in the eye, laughing. The tall and thin slip in like fins of sharks, gritting bloody teeth. On the dark corners, they fight with breath so hard, move to the beats. In walks Keith, rock and roll goes, perpetual smoke pours from his lip. Puts his arm out for the usual. Bartender nods in agreement. The regulars make like regulars, playing cool by the jukebox, playing cool in the light, all at attention. He's angling over, locking up a doo-wop tune so soon. He calls up a girl to dance, body tight, match light, groping the way down, falling for him. Stranger dolled up just enough in her eyes, a magic puff backing away. He stands there watching her dance alone, smoke lifting, original Van Gogh painting her with his eyes, ashes filled at the tip. No jumping jack flash, no rolling stones, cock eyed and wonderful. Blues on a Monday night, thump thumping to a seduced bar crowd. Here to see Billy go at it again. His band is really big shit. Yeah, yeah. To my left is a Molly man. To my right is Keith, tap tapping his knee skin, jiggling the cubes in the glass, smoking a rocket ship cigarette, blazing. His face is a weather map. 
takes me through to Phoebe, to the cold under, whispers something in my ear, can't understand, Bob Bob in my head, smoking a rocket ship cigarette, alarming. He blows a whistle into the air, loud and above it. I give Billy the fist pump, look at me, I got Keith sitting beside me, orange and blue, like a Dex hammy boy bitching. So like he doesn't stay for the encore, makes his way out before Billy there on stage smashing his guitar. Keith would have liked that. Maybe he wasn't live with Leeds. He was cool with a cigarette, held that baby down, played the chord so easy, always hammering down, lighting up a crowd. Never saw him play it live. Here on A, he never bothered to strap it up. Just walked in on us when we least expected. Sad, listen on dangerously. We were the lucky ones. We never saw Mick, Charlie, or Ronnie. We saw Keith sitting there with a the smoke, glass of fire, water, and cubes, playing himself. A delicate British gentleman walking wounded, crazy with the days. Thank you. Thank you, Kofi. Thank you, buddy. All right, we got a little time shift. We're going to have to bring up Eitan Stern Weber. Come on, buddy. Un unmute yourself. Eitan, you there? Yeah, it doesn't let you unmute on your own. You need to let me. Okay, cool. Um, can I uh, can I share my screen real quick? Because there is something I would like you all to see for this piece. Okay. I found my heritage in a postcard. Did like any other piece of post, August 23rd, in an ordinary old world script, stumbled upon during the standard closet cleaning at my grandmother's apartment. I first held the brown, brittle piece of paper like a sheet of soap in glass. I began to read the claustrophobic scribbles when I realized that this analog item, this opaque screen needed no light to come alive as a four dimensional window into a time and a place and a person. The scrap of dying memory was the vertex of chance and humanity that manifested itself as my great grandfather. This postcard wasn't just wish you were here. This withering wisp of once this withering wisp of once white scroll said, I love you and I need you so much so that I won't tell you this is the last time you'll ever hear from me. You see, this postcard was sent from Paris in 1943, a few days after Passover. My family knows this because every Passover, we would see the youth, the fear, the tears in my grandmother's eyes as she recounted the tale of the Nazis storming in mid Seder that one damned year and how the last time she saw her father, her vision was obscured by crimson and jet black armbands. As the last vestige of communication we can know my great grandfather ever sent, sitting in a filth ridden, overcrowded Grancy soccer stadium, he wrote, tomorrow, I'm being taken to an unknown destination with a thousand others. In that moment, he reached his hand through the ink and held mine so as to brace me for what was to come. Mes chers, si je souffre, c'est seulement pour vous, parce que je ne sais pas dans quel état vous êtes. Je vous embrasse en vous prions d'être calme. My dearest ones, if I suffer, it is only for you because I don't know that you're okay. In my mind, I'm holding you in hope that you'll stay calm. I lied to them. I told them all would be well. I talked about clothes and friends and finances. He loved them too deeply to collapse in fear from what everybody knew. The cattle cars left full and came back empty. A few more weeks, if not days of denial, was the only gift that could be given by a man stripped of everything by sacrificing the chance to say goodbye. His hand receded back into the lines of lost stoics and the paper seemed to crumble. In oh so little matter and mentality, I met a man, I felt his fear, I learned of love and life, and felt an unmistakable sense of pride from calling that giving tree a part of me. I found my heritage in a postcard and I haven't looked at pen and paper the same way since. Wow, beautiful. Thank you, Aitan. Take the page down, please. Yep. Thank you. 
Okay, coming up next, the downtown queen of punk poetry and punk music, Miss Puma Pearl. All peas here. <laughs> Thank you. And this is called Death Valley Bodega. I don't know if my friend David Smith died as he wished, a white dove shooting from his mouth. This morning I woke wondering how close the end is and which books to read while I still have a chance. My only hope is that the dog goes first. She's not even mine and I'm not anybody's, but my kids deserve the relief of unburdening my weight if I ever grow as heavy as my mother or my father standing confused, peeing in doorways. In Bodega Alley, the vet sits in his wheelchair, surrounded by clothing and umbrellas. His friend folds up the tent, invisible city down here at the bottom. Manhattan hides behind cranes and jackhammers. We buy Bodega coffee and dollar bagels. Diva, the wonder dog, waits by the fence and an occupied blue beach chair by her side. Nobody touches anyone else's property in Bodega Alley. People know what is theirs. An open umbrella in sunlight. A radio playing Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes. Wake up, everybody. Hurricanes to the south of us. Construction northeast and west. Down here at the bottom, it looks the same. The children of nobody sleep in the alley. The men play dominoes on the corner. Wheelchairs cruise down the block. Diva waits for her breaded bagel. At home, I hear from a friend. She says she's dying. We all are, I think. Unsure of how to leave before the party ends while I still remember how to walk. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Puma, thank you. When I used to do open mics, I used to drift around from clique to clique. Every little open mic had a little crowd of uh, people who I didn't know and didn't know me. And when I went to the Juju Mukto Tea Lounge many years ago, uh, I read there every week to practice reading in front of people who didn't like what I did. That's mainly the reason I went there. I didn't know anyone there. And the only person and the first person ever came up to me and said, Hey, I like your stuff. Why don't you come back again? It was George Wallace. He's up next. Come on, George. Ah, I don't know about that. Thanks. It was the old reggae. It was the one stop from Flam. It was a very good ride, a big move, a big mistake. And she with those flim flam tears. And she with those flim flam eyes. And she lit me up. And okay, she smoked me right then. And there. She was not one of those fast ones, was she, honey? No, she burned real slow. She burned real bright. She burned steady and right through me like the green surface of a sea slipping slow mo through the guts of a globe. Oh, crocodile, she smiled. I love you so. And she bit me and I bit her, but I didn't bite long enough or hard enough. And here's the long and short of it. No, no, she said, you do not know. And she said, no, no, you are not the one. It was a get even hoodlum voodoo moment. The same old, same for me. And I don't know how high in the sky a man has got to go to be the unemotional one. But up I go every time. I go up every mountain. I run, I run till the mountain runs out. And when I reach the top, I touch the sky and I say, how many, how many, Lord, how many times a man has got to? And I say, Lord, tell a man. And the Lord says, I know, son, I know. And Lord says, and by the way, you know, I know, you know. Oh, yeah. The good Lord knows it. I say this over a thousand times a day. It's a kind of prayer. Thank you. Thank you, George. George is always George. Yes. Thank you, buddy. All right, next coming up. 
I met this lady at uh, Weath Reproductions at Bar 82 and uh, was for fiction writers. And I loved her so much. She was one of the first people I brought over to Identity Bar and her indeed. Un unmute yourself and give your shit, man. <laughs> Thank you. Gooseberries. The earliest lives I remember were in the Eastern lands, wet and fertile with rice and fish, civilized world, man, art, and cleanliness. But there are too many of us to support, and some of us had to move. We traveled along the steppe, a desert of grass. We learned to ride horses and to herd goats and sheep, a few cattle. We drank their milk, and when they were old, slaughtered them and gorged on the meat. Those were festivals. My mouth always waters at the smell of roasting flesh. I was a king's daughter. That is, my father called himself a king. But we were poor. A man had to stay put to be a king, to rule over the others too wretched to move, trapped on the dry land that can only grow grass, and people can't eat grass. When my mother died, brittle and pale as winter hay, my father married again, and soon I had two sisters. The younger was harmless, mild and slow, but the older one was like me. It was as if she had a third eye. She missed nothing. When our mother sent us out to pasture with our one little red cow, only a crust of gritty bread to eat, my sister caught me bowing to the animal, drinking the milk from her udder. Once in a while, I would cut a hole in her shoulder to suck the blood as it pulsed near the skin, hot and sweet. I could feel its warmth inside me, nourishing my bones and my heart. Perhaps I should have shared, but one little cow does not produce much milk, even less if she is bled. And if I was going to get out, I needed to be strong, not good. That cow, her blood and milk, turned me from a starved girl into a fine woman with high round breasts and a belly that cried its red tears each month, mourning the child it had not been given. So my sister told and our little cow was slaughtered while she was still young before her milk had dried up. It was time for me to move on from this stupid family, my sisters thin and dirty, wrapping themselves in rags and hunched over with famine like peasants, their heads crawling with lice. My father was kind, and he gave me some of the cow's guts with the shit that would allow something else to grow on this sterile grassland. I grew berries, sweet and juicy like my body that should not always be a barren step. The birds who could move about as we used to made nests in the bushes and guarded the fruit from all but me. When Prince Ivan came to find a wife, only I could give him what he craved, he was the son of another self-styled king, but his family was richer than ours, living on the western edge of the steppe where more crops grew, and he had noblemen with vast holdings to pay him rent in kind. I walked like a queen, straight backed, head up, as I brought him the large bowl heaped with woman fruit, womb red and vein purple, and I looked him full in the face. It was a good face, sharp and hard and no nonsense about him and wise. There's nothing to be gained from marrying a stupid man. The power he inherited will squander, the wife and children the first to be sacrificed. Prince Ivan didn't smile, but he lowered his eyelids in satisfaction at the wife who had chosen him. We lived happily at first. My only source of disquiet was my husband's old tutor, Yevgeny, Evgeny recognized me, my selfishness and my greed. Although I should rather when my husband did not come to my bed, I hunted him down, and there he was, his mouth on that old man's cock, like a boy with his master. Ah, now I saw. When my husband was a youth, and Evgeny a man in his prime, that's how their love had been, nor had it ended all these years later. When Ivan came to me the next night, I made sure he got me pregnant, and I bore a son, that for Evgeny. But the tutor was a kind man and my friend, and I should not have doubted him. Everything was so good that I almost threw it away. 
I wanted to show my father all that had grown from his one act of compassion and from our little red cow. I brought my son and my fine husband home for a visit and that's when it happened. And if you want to know what happened and how it ends, get the anthology. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Anne Herodine. You hadn't been reading for a long time. I'm glad she's back. Good to hear you again, Anne. Glad to be here. Thank you. All right. All the way from Kathmandu by way of uh, Barnes & Noble Bookstore in 6th Avenue and 8th Street, where I met him for the very first time many years ago. Stu Richards, the musician, used to host a show there. He was the upstairs manager. And you, you came up because he was checking to see if his book was prominently displayed at the in the, count, in the counters up front there. And he ha happened to wander into the reading and he said he liked my work. And I had no idea who he was, but here he is again, back from Kathmandu. Come on, view you. Mm, namaste. Namaste, everybody. Uh, it's two o'clock in the morning in Kathmandu and I'm reading my poem on New York City, Latino Love. Latino Love found me in a bustling NYC party accidentally. Latino Love took me to be a shaman, for sure. My black bags bulging from magical rainbows, serpents of Hindu heaven, skull of an abducted female yeti, magic mushrooms, yarcha gumba, and other Himalayan aphrodisiacs to raise even a stodgy stone from its Amazon sleep. Latino love adored my pagan adulation of her long brown legs, golden limbed goddess inside her spacious body's wide sanctuary. Latino love wished to make love to me all night long, translating my works except love poem into Spanish. Latino love wanted to rest, rent my brown body, turn it into a sacred sutra, a Sufi song, or a shahatu shawl to wrap around her shoulders all the time in all NYU parties. Latino love said she understood the sanguine silence of my snow peaks. Latino love wanted to wanted some action right away. Flowers of wild passions wet from an impassioned breaths. Can you read my future? She asked, spreading her palm after the waves had receded. Maybe there's a juju in the spidery maze of these heavenly alleys. Latino love wanted to be a wife I already had. Namaste. Thank you, Yuyu. Yu. Now, coming up next is Bonnie Joy. I met her at Bar 82 at a fiction reading, and I found out years later that she does a lot more. Bonnie Joy's in Switzerland now, I think, and she's going to give us a little reading. Come on, Bonnie. Thank you. Brooklyn, New York, seen from space for all of my dead spirit family. It's been mapped, photographed, and described many times. What you can see from the moon and what you cannot. Each of us at our own subway stop, on a street, in our bathroom where we hide in the shower on Tuesday nights, as the larger world continues on without us. We look out the window, up at the stars and wonder if someone in the Andromeda galaxy is gazing at our Milky Way, also hiding and thinking our same exact thoughts. With all of this life stretching out around us, will we ever be heard? Will we be missed? Is someone missing us right now? Thanks. Thank you, Bonnie. Good to see you again, lady. It's been a long time. Okay, coming up next, uh, somebody you probably remember from earlier in the show. His name's Anthony C. Murphy. I met him at 116 McDougal Street where we were the only person, persons who supported the bar there. Murph, come on up and give us something. This is called Moon Cows. Beneath us roils the Hudson, it flows both ways. These houses, half up a suburban hill, half down a buried mound, once an orchard for the Dutch, have the feel of an island town, cut off by that muddy swirl. Over the river are the ancient palisades, where the sun sets. Whatever trees were sacrificed for this estate, others have grown up in place. 
Mighty maples sway on our street. Oaks broaden the canopy over the aqueduct. Skunk, raccoon, deer and coyote roam free until our locked dog gets his hackles out of the gate. The river below flows from nature's effort, swollen with human effluent. But from this distance, we cannot smell it. We do not see the dead fish, just the silver kiss of reflection. And what else dies here? Their faces turn, but do not see the ripples on the surface. Below this meniscus, blood and bones, blue or purple due to no breath. We were lunatics to do this. I fish the bloody twins out of the toilet bowl. The Hudson will not get them. The ER does, bagged and tagged with spontaneous abortion. You were not scared and you wish to do it again. On the full moon you ovulate. We have no time to reflect. And what else is there to this life but more of it? It only flows one way. Thanks. Thank you, Murph. Wow. Okay, coming up next, I also met at 116 McDougal Street. Uh, she was the first person at a poetry reading that made me laugh out loud. Janet Restino, come on. Clicking on it. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah. <sighs> I'm weak to the finish cause I ate my spinach. I got them E. coli blues, threw up on my shoes. To da da dum bo da dum dum, to da da dum bo da dum dum. I got me a salad with feta cheese, some walnuts and dressing. Well, that spinach brought me to my knees. Oh, oh, oh well. I got them, I got them, I got them E. coli blues, E. coli blues. Well, that bag of greens, yeah, that was the means. That bag of spinach, yeah, that was my finish. E. coli blues, E. coli blues. Well, I bought it at the grocery store. I ain't shopping there no more. I bought it in the produce section. You damn straight. I'm gonna vote in the next election cause that FDA is still collecting their pay. No more of this shit. Oh, I bit and I got hit with them E. coli blues. Them E. coli blues. E. coli blues. E. coli blues. Well, I could have died, been on my last ride. I could have checked out on the world. Worldwide, had my insides fried. I could have died. I could have been dead. Lights out in my head. No more sex in bed. Cause of what I was fed, I might as well have eaten lead. E. coli blues, E. coli blues, E. coli blues. Till the doc came and fixed me. He got me an IV, cost me a big fee. No more spinach for me, no more spinach for me, no more spinach for me. E. coli blues, what the hell am I gonna eat? E. coli blues, maybe some broccoli, some string beans. Whoa, them Brussels sprouts, I got my doubts. E. coli blues, E. coli blues, E. coli blues. I'm gonna grow my own E. coli blues. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Janet. All right, we're running a little behind. We're gonna have to cut out the chit chat that I'm doing here before you're reading. Robert Gibbons, come on up, buddy. Robert, are you there? Well, maybe we'll save Robert for later. Stephanie Rogers is there. I can see your beautiful face. Come on, Stephanie. Unmute yourself. My dog, the 
doesn't do wacky weather. She looks up at me, brown eyes shining, and barks at me through a mouthful of leash. I lean onto my side without getting up to push her back towards her own bed, hoping she'll get the message. Instead, she licks my hand free of the last crumbs of cheese crackers I shouldn't have had the night before. I scratch her between her ears and under her chin before rolling over to groan at the gray sky that snarls through my bedroom windows, already damp with large forbidding drops fresh from the clouds that are about to break. It's Saturday. I know a storm is coming and I want the covers under my chin securing the knowledge that I don't have to get up early. All she knows is that it's daytime again and she wants me all to herself. She barks at me again, more loudly this time as the leash has dropped from her mouth. Still, she refuses her presence to be denied. She jumps up on my bed turns in a circle, plops down in a heap of gray shag at my feet, and pouts for whatever she thinks she's missing outside. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Good to see you again, lady. Hey, coming up next, all the way from Long Island, Russ Green. Unmute yourself, Russ. I am unmuted, I think. Yes. Okay, cool. <clears throat> all right, guys. Um, all right. Fatherland. Solace on the other side of the sound, waiting for the bottom to come up, for the fish to drag the interminable wail of childhood scars to the surface, the beating of wild drums echoes through the rib cage. Escape from the lockstep jackboot heel, crushed gardenias in the flower bed that was my flesh, jackboot heel, crushed candy canes that were my bones, jackboot heel, crushed the crayons I used to brighten my lonely canvas, that jackboot heel sent a blitzkrieg through the sky, pierced the sun with bolts of lightning, burned my joy, you burned my joy, I want it back, you spilled my blood, stretched me till I cracked, splattered eyeballs across a once free shining dance floor, jack boot clinging to the night, this dark molasses memoir, a film noir, a sea of names I could have cut a rug with, now languishes among the broken barnacles and dried blood of washed up mollusks crashing possibilities against the sure footed captain's feet. I hop over gunnels, climb to the safety of the wheelhouse, the helmsman's yelling at me to grab the wheel while he battens the hatches. He screams, you got to take those waves head on, man, or it's all over. Surfing the crests, pounding down between peaks until the parting of heavenly chaos, peaceful waters, the jackboot heels floating, broken, sinking, gone. Ah. Thank, Thank you, Russ. Thank you, everyone. Right. You. Coming up next, the high school teacher storyteller I wish I'd had in high school. Karen Levy, give that to us. Fury. The raft was made of a soft mesh that allowed her body to dip into the water. It was nothing like the rafts and tubes the vendors sold on the beach those fluorescent plastics that prop you up so you lay atop hot and sticky. Even as the Sunday crowds played in the shallow waters of Boca Chica, throwing bottles of rum and splashing and making out, Serena was lulled to sleep, enveloped by the sea. Her bikini showed the smooth hugeness of her belly. 
Yahira stood beside her with one hand on the raft. Colorless fish encircled her waist. They were good friends now, best friends, except that Serena wouldn't share the secret behind her belly. She shook her head whenever Yahira asked and pressed her lips together. And Yahira knew it was shame for what she'd done, but Serena would have the baby anyway. A group of pelicans soared overhead. Without warning, they dove into the water close to the bathers, surfacing with silver-bellied fish in their bills. Flapping along the surface of the water, they swallowed their prey and rose up to search out their next bite. The bathers were caught in the excitement of the hunt, with some children screaming in terror and others with delight. Serena, Yahira shook the raft. I'm going for Poppy's camera. I have to get a picture of these birds. I'll be right back. The games of tossing bottles of rum stopped as everyone watched the precision with which the birds hit the water and rose with their beaks full. One pelican rose from the sea with an enormous fish in its beak. It struggled as it flew higher and all their bathers, all the bathers caught their breath when they saw the fish. It was bigger than the bird itself big enough to feed a family. The fish, a deep red color, fought back. It shook itself partway out of the giant bill, but the bird gulped it over and over to prevent its escape. The bathers laughed and cheered and made bets on both sides. A second bird flew in. It tried to snatch away the prey, but the first bird swallowed down the better part of the fish and then struck his opponent with the fish's tail. The bathers roared with delight and the second bird flew off screaming, but returned to fly circles around the first, and then it lunged. The first bird veered sharply to escape the attack. Its wings beat powerfully as it moved with its prey, but then it opened its beak just the slightest bit, just enough for the fish to twist away and free fall the great distance back to the sea. Its scaled body caught the sun and shone iridescent as it dove toward home. And just before it hit the water, the second bird swooped in and smoothly swallowed it halfway down its long neck. The bathers cheered. No one noticed the sleeping woman floating away. Once Serena drifted from the circle of bathers, she was caught in a current that pulled her out from the safety of the beach and into the open sea. She was just a speck of belly when Yahira returned for her. Poppy, Poppy, she shouted, it's Serena. He stood up from his chair and followed her finger as she pointed out to sea. She's floating away, Yahira yelled, and they both ran for one, the, one of the fishing boats on shore. Llama la policia, call the police, her father called at a man with a cell phone. Mi mujer está alejando hacia el hondo. My woman is floating away. Yahira stopped. She stared at his choice of words. The speck of belly disappeared behind La Matica, the mangrove island a quarter mile out that separated the beach from the sea. Her father called for her help and they pushed the boat through the crowds of Sunday bathers and people jumped out of their way and they climbed into the boat and her father pulled the oars out from under the seat and rowed wildly. All the while, Yahira stayed calm. She'd been quick to react, running for her father, heaving the boat into the water to save her friend. Now, she was stilled by his frenzy. He was talking to himself fast and low. Oh God, help me. Why isn't there a motor, coño, as he plunged the oars into the water? She didn't offer to help. She watched him lose himself to his rescue attempt. He dropped an oar and had to jump overboard for it. And the sun played tricks on them. They traveled in circles. And finally they reached the raft and it was running its own course. Serena was gone. Her father threw down the oars. Coño, que vaina. Tears fell from his eyes like stones, hard and round. They bounced off his thighs and over the hull of the boat into the sea. He stood up and jumped. Yahira sat back, cold to his loss. He dove down into the dark blue water, resurfaced and dove again. She lost count of how many times. He dove until he was exhausted, bobbing with one hand 
on the boat's hull, he sucked in huge mouthfuls of air. La policia, came a shout from a motorboat headed their way. Ayudame, help, her father croaked between ragged breaths. Goño, she's pregnant with my baby. And Yahira threw up into the beautiful salty sea. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Coming up next, the godmother of storytelling in New York City, who is now in Boston, Barbara Alaprenas. Un unmute yourself, Barbara. <clears throat> Once upon a time, a baby was born and the world was a happy place. Mom and dad were overjoyed as they welcomed their brand new baby boy. The world indeed was a happy place. Mom and dad talked about their hopes and fears as they learned to deal with the baby's tears. Is the baby hot? Is the baby cold? Why won't he do what he's told? Okay, so he's only six months old. While this baby's world was a happy place, this baby's world was a quiet place. And a day arrived, mom's face changed. Mom's face showed anguish, mom's face showed pain. What's wrong? What, what can it be? I hope there's nothing wrong with me. They went for help as fast as they could. They did everything any parent would. Dad looks so strange, mom's so sad. I hope it's not because I've been bad. The doctor looked serious. The doctor looked sad. There was no question about it. The news was bad. From doctor to doctor, the family went. They went wherever they were sent. They hoped for the best, but still the story stayed the same. I'm sorry, mom, your baby can't hear. My baby is deaf? Is that what you mean? While the baby could not hear her, he saw her scream. He saw the grief upon her face. And the world was no longer a happy place. Something's wrong with me. What can it be? I can't understand what I see, but one thing's clear. Something's wrong with me. They talked behind him. They talked to his face. He could not hear the words, but the message was clear. Something's wrong because I can't hear. He tried to make him understand. He made faces. He moved his hands. Why are they crying when they look at me? Don't they know that I can see that something's very wrong with me? How can I make them understand? I don't know why they can't love me the way I am. If this poem made you feel sad, imagine what it's like to be a child and to think you're bad. Thank you. Barbara Ella Brand, that's the one and only. One and only. We grew up together at the Inspired Word, Miranda Marine Shepherd. Come on, unmute. without ceasing. If I'd known the last time I hugged you and this moment would be separated by an eternity, I'd have hugged you without ceasing. I'd have memorized the worry lines in your forehead whenever something thought provoking crosses your path. And for the record, there are four and a half and the top line extends the longest. I'd have memory foamed the tone of your voice first thing in the morning when you roll over and belt out that good morning baby in that sing song guttural voice. I'd have taken care to study how your embrace in daylight differs from your embrace in nightlight from behind like all you've ever wanted and some of what you didn't think to ask for was safely nestled between your heart and your forearm. If I'd had known that eternity could be four minutes, 38 hours, and seven weeks, I'd have dreaded this moment 
spared myself memories of what used to be, loved you without ceasing. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, that's beautiful. Okay, met this lady at Piano Bar many, many years ago and we have lunch together and I love her stories. Marie Sabatino, come on up. Great, thank you, Philip. Um, this piece is called What the Hell is Love? And it's actually named after a show that Philip curated several years back. So this is dedicated to Philip. What the hell is love? I am seven years old and I know one thing for sure. I love those beautiful brown rabbits that my daddy brings home for me, my brother, and my sister. We take care of them nice, feed them real good, and they become bigger and bigger every day. We name them Bugs and Elmer. What I don't know yet is that their necks will be snapped and there will be a sharp popping sound confirming their demise. Easter dinner. Que bello, daddy says. At 12 years old, I think I love the corner of the bed as my best friend Dawn teaches me what happens when we open our legs and climb on top, pushing ourselves against it over and over again, riding the perfect edge like a pony, giddy with joy at this new discovery in her bedroom attic. At 13 years old, I want to love French kissing, really I do, but it's like drinking a giant fishbowl of saliva with a snake jumping out to attack you. At 14 years old, I have my second French kiss with this badass black kid who's two years older than me and therefore far more experienced. And I learned that I love, love, love French kissing after all. At 15, I wait desperately for love. At 17, I meet Ralph. And as much as I try to catch up with his love, I never do. I have no idea what to do with this love that begs and pants like a hungry puppy. So I make out with Ralph's best friend. But Ralph forgives me, so I have to do the dirty deed of breaking up with him instead. At 20, I fall unabashedly in love with an artist and he falls even worse for me. He teaches me everything I know about love and he teaches me about the giving of oneself with your soul. So of course, I destroy this love by the time I'm 21. At 21 and a half, I think I might love someone else, a writer who plays guitar and looks like Ethan Hawke when he was in that Reality Bites film. The Ethan Hawke lookalike doesn't love me back, but he is absolutely in love with my mouth on his penis. Then the mouth gets terribly bored, or is it the penis that gets bored first? I don't remember. And so the penis and the mouth go their separate ways. At 24, I move to the East Village and fall in love with another artist. I try cocaine for the first time, then I try it again, and then I try it some more. We drink lots of vodka at KGB bar. We write poetry with black markers on my bedroom walls, and we make suicide plans in the early morning hours. But we never see it through, the suicide or the relationship. In the remaining years before I turn 30, I collect men on the Lower East Side the way my mom collects pretty smelling candles. The candles last much longer. At 30, I fall in love again, once more with the writer. He is 19 years older than me, and he treats me like a mouthful of strawberry flavored, bubblicious bubblegum. I am a giant bubble of euphoria. Life could not possibly be better than this. At 31, I fall in love with a fetus that I cannot touch or hold or rock back and forth. But there it is, the doctor says, pointing at the screen. There it is, growing inside of me. And before I know it, there it is, the heart that suddenly stops beating. And then there it goes, dying, someplace deep inside I can't even see. I cry the cry of the hysterical every time I sit on the toilet for the next several days. When it is all finished and done with, I cry even more. Then I cry some more and more. And uh, later that year, I fall in love with a mutt. They say maybe she's a Jack Russell and a Pitbull mix. She is the worst animal in the world. She despises every single dog in all of New York City and she wants to massacre each and every one of them at all times. Going for walks with her is like going to war. It turns out that I love that little devil beast of a mutt more than I love any human. Well, maybe except for my kid nephew. I'll call that a tie. A few years later, the little devil beast of a mutt gets cancer and she's not even five. 
I mean, $10,000 worth of debt from all the doctor's visits and the surgery and the chemotherapy, she dies anyway. And it's like my heart finally throws in the towel. Everything falls apart in my relationship of seven years. I tell him it's over and that I'm leaving. He doesn't stop me. I move out two weeks later. I promise to never fall in love again. I begin to write these stories about my life and I think maybe even love them a little too, but I can end them whenever I want, put them away when I'm finished. This past summer, I meet someone new. He's not an artist, he's not a writer, maybe what one would even call an ordinary guy. When I'm not with him, I feel dizzy and lost. When I am with him, I feel safe and sound. Is that what love is? Those simple moments when time is on pause and your heart is at ease and there is a body holding the entire length of you, making you feel without a single care in the world, everything safe and sound. So I think to myself, maybe I'm finally ready to stop running from love. Just don't hold me to it. Thank you. Thank you. I love you, Marie. Thank you. All the way from Dunkirk, New York, up by Lake Erie, Vincent Quatroche. Hi. The missing beat link. In my mind's eye, I can see him sitting in a midtown bar near Penn Station over near 14th Street, or 34th actually, around supper time in the mid-October of 1961. He's young and fresh off a train from Philadelphia in town to audition for an off, off, off Broadway play. He's nearly broke and nursing a stepped on flat draft thinking, He's got to find a job somewhere pronto. The jukebox is playing I Found My Thrill on Blueberry Hill by Fats Domino, and by nature, he's minding his own business, despite some random glances from a blonde down the end of the bar. Good luck with that, he considers. I'm broke, and I'm not Elvis. So in strolls this tall, dark-haired man, shy and really strikingly good-looking, he looks like a college halfback with quiet good manners that sits down on the rickety stool next to him and orders politely a speed rack whiskey. They exchange wary glances. The big man produces a small spiral notebook and lights a butt and starts writing in it. Phil sighs in relief. Well, at least he's another a-hole with an axe to grind. Lost in his own thoughts, he barely sees the two other fellows enter the bar and surround his seatmate. One is an intense looking Jewish guy with curly black hair and thick horn rimmed glasses fronting wild eyes. His sidekick is a strapping classic Roman profile bruiser with a big booming laugh. Their intense, animated, enthusiastic conversation is infectious. Clearly, they know something that nobody else in the bar has a clue about. And they're having a trinity gone in the holy goof. Despite himself, he finds himself ears dropping to at some point when his glass had been dry way too long. The one guy, the other one called Jack, looks over at him with a big smile and says, hey buddy, join us. Can I get you a drink? Thank you, Vincent. Very nice. All right. Simone Nicole. Hello, everyone. Hey, how are you? I am in the middle of work, but we're going to make this work. <laughs> so the poem I'm doing is called Diamond Flower. If my diamond was a woman, she would flower as she said my name. She would spread her petals. One, I wish I could circumcise my lips to rid you of the five years of torment, the five years of sacrificial healing. Two, I hope you don't remember them. I heard that we can finally reverse the trauma brain. Three, but where was that scientific advancement when you were nine? Four, when you were 12. 12 poems bled your pain, ink stains are still maintained on your heart. Five, I heard time heals all wounds, but what happened when time reopens wounds each guy that, with each guy that smiled my way? Six, I know I turned my back on you, but I too have to heal from my pain. I don't clean myself like men, so remnants of wolves in sheep's clothing still remain. 
no matter how many times I am showered by Oshun's waves and God's rays. Seven, the sun doesn't visit here that often. The clothes limit the progress of healing from this train wreck of a past, a past that was never supposed to be written like that. Eight, so I guess that's why you picked up your pen. Your fingers took a break from caressing me to try to free yourself of the weeds they left because they didn't know when to leave. Nine, leave, leave, leaves. They blow in the breeze, but their presence is never forgotten. When are you going to get that appointment to reverse that damage? The gray matter, the white matter, all pain, whatever color matters. 10, I wish I could circumcise my lips to exercise the demons who followed you and looked like love, but you would have never glowed like you do now. Stamping your presence as healing in action, marking your eyes with hope, a defibrillator to your big heart. 10, 10, 10, your big heart beats again every time he reminds you of your magic, your beauty, your challenges, your creativity, and so you bloom ever so brightly, ever so strong. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. Been so long since I saw you. Good to have you back. I know, so nice to see everybody. Yeah. All right, coming up next, she's not just a poet, she's a sailor and one of my favorite mermaids. <laughs> All right, dying wishes. He's holding a beer in most every memory I have of him. My childhood cluttered with glass bottles, multiplying, metastasizing. After decades of alcohol and cocaine, he was 14 years clean, but only morphine could relieve the pain. Stage four at 54, pancreatic cancer. He needed too much dope to die at home, so he was admitted into hospice, where kindly retired firemen strolled the halls, pushing a cart of top shelf liquor and everything besides to comfort the dying and those who love them. Vodka, whiskey, wine, gin, and even Pabst Blue Ribbon, his staple, the piss draining from his body through a tube was the color of Guinness. Now, during his last nights on earth, I encouraged him to have a drink. He enjoyed it so much once upon a time. No, he said. As the ivy drip trickled from above his bed, machine blanking morphine over his head, I'm dying sober. Wow. Thank you. Jane LaCroix, thank you. Coming up next, she's an actress, she's a shaman, and she's a hell of a poet. Lindell Samuel. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Wow, that's hard to follow. Wow, what a deep poem. Thank you. <clears throat> so this is shadow boxing. Long denied resentments after years of being tamped down, comes screaming into the daylight, like a great black-winged banshee, hideous and unwanted emotional dross, sears my psyche. How could I, sweet, caring, spiritually evolving little me, feel such seething animosity for someone I love? Well, how dare she trigger ancient wounds by not caring for me the way I needed my father to show me love. Wait, 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 what? What? Who said that? That's Fakakta. Wow. Now that this shadow story has geysered up, how shall I dispense with it? Can I steadfastly subdue it as if it were some hideous bridge troll? Hoping that when faced down, it will allow me to pass, even offer up its treasure to me. Perhaps I must engage in mortal combat. In mortal combat, blasting it into a thousand tiny shards, 
No, that won't do, because what if those tiny resentment shards all take root and grow into a dark forest of angry reeds? Fantastic. Now I'm in a 1950s sci-fi movie. Wow. Mind is constantly running amok. By turns frightening itself and then amusing itself, denying itself, and then overindulging. Here I am in this place of wit's end, having forgotten what propelled me here in the first place. Oh yeah, that's right. It was the <laughs> screaming banshee of unreleased resentments. Well, maybe I'll just give that old banshee a hug and offer it some chocolate. Thank you, Phil. Thank, thank you, Linda. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Linda and Murph. Mwah. Love y'all. Keeping Matthew Abuelo's memory alive, his wife Vivian will read his piece from the anthology. Thank you, Philip. This is called Random Thoughts. Do the can collectors still hear the melody which comes before the steam heat hisses? And will they waltz in St. Vitus's dance through the heavy metal doors? Ruin is a rebirth or an abortion. The abortion is less cruel. Have you realized that heaven's watchman is absent, not just for you, but for the Haitian kid buried under the latest storm, first announced on the 5 a.m. news and finds all his prayers were pleased to an empty room he once thought full? Do they, the can collectors, dream of seeing New York City from an airplane high above, out of sight of the for rent signs, eviction notices, the wards and emergency rooms, parades, some which break out in colors and languages, while others lead to drunken resentment, delis, and the gentrification of Spanish Harlem. After all, if the pigeons can escape the sound of car horns, which announce the boredom of those waiting to get through the Holland Tunnel, and what is a city that hides behind an ocean of lights 30,000 feet below? And have the shut-ins grown wary of the intrusion that comes through the radiators, forcing them to open their windows onto an unloyal city they chose mm -hmm. to escape? but never left at all. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Matthew is still here. He's just going away for a while. All right, my brother from Philadelphia, from another mother, Joe Rorty, bring it on. Joe, you were here before, you're still here? Yes, you hear me? Yeah, now we can. Okay. The cooperative unity of mankind, glimpsed in its amputated pieces, its melancholy and bad habits, the thoroughness of the disaster that it intends, that it has brought about, strewn behind it, more than burning bridges and the cries of the dispossessed, its outrageous lies reducing truth to tears that it kicks down the stairs, out into the street, Palms of no recompense, men with no fortune, the bitter life we lead at the bottom of the cup, infamous in the forevering instance of its legend, its bad reputation, its damned salvation. Thank you, Joe. Yes. Okay, Maria Chisholm in from New Jersey. Maria? Are you with us? Well, maybe we'll pick her up later. The one and only Zeb Torres. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, Maria. Okay, take it away. Yeah. Okay. Good to see you, Philip. Hi, Linda. This is great. I'm so happy to be here. This poem is for written for Langston Hughes. In the house of Mr. Hughes, where he sat and slept and prayed, in the house of Mr. Hughes, where he ate and wrote for days. House of language, cups of tea, bougie black folks, novelist was he. Sleepless nights in the house of Hughes, where he ate and wrote for days. Books and language was his thirst lit up the house in praise. 
Thank you, Maria. Thanks. Okay, um, I'm gonna take a break. Um, for those of you who joined late, no intros, please. We have really tight for time. We have 75 readers. If you wanna say anything, say it in the chat room. You could advertise your book, sell it anything you want. Mainly just sit here and listen. I'm gonna turn it over to Anthony Murphy now. Take it away, Murphy. 